Today, the World Health Organization officially announced that this is a global pandemic. We're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity. It is 10 times more lethal than the seasonal flu. Growing international concerns and awareness of the new coronavirus. China is now reporting more than 100 Chinese deaths. Chinese health officials confirming 77 new cases of the mysterious new strain. The whole world needs to take action and be more ready. More and more states are ratcheting up their efforts to prevent or at least slow down the continuous spread of COVID-19. Things will get worse before they get better. Be on alert. Dr. Li Wenliang sounds the alarm. A few patients inside the Wuhan Central Hospital have been suffering from a mysterious illness, an undiagnosed pneumonia. Dr. Li has just seen the test results. Seven confirmed cases of SARS. Li sends his message via WeChat to his former classmates from medical school. So frightening comes one response. An hour later, Lee, a 33-year-old ophthalmologist, sends an update. It is confirmed that they are coronavirus infections. He adds the patients have been quarantined in the emergency department, and the outbreak seems to be linked to a nearby seafood market. The group worries that an epidemic is on the way. Memories of SARS, a coronavirus outbreak that killed 800 people in 2003 are still fresh. Warn your loved ones, writes Dr. Lee. Tell them to take protective measures, but do so privately. Lee's message was intended for his friends, but the word gets out. Screenshots make their way onto social media. His name is not blurred out. Dr. Lee knows some form of punishment is on its way. At midnight, he is hauled into the police station. He's accused of making false comments that severely disturb the social order. Lee signs a statement confessing to his illegal behavior. But by this point, his alert is spreading. And like the virus he wrote about, it can't be contained. An hour after being hauled into the police station, Dr. Lee is released. On January 8th, he treats an 82-year-old patient who runs a stall in the nearby food market. She has glaucoma and a few other odd symptoms, but no fever. Two days later, Dr. Lee starts coughing. He sends his family hundreds of miles away and checks himself into a hotel. The last thing he wants to do is infect his loved ones. On January 12th, Dr. Lee is in the hospital, this time as a patient. He's struggling to breathe on his own, and soon he's moved to the ICU. On WeChat, Lee tells a reporter that he expects to recover in another 15 or so days. One week later, he's dead. Viruses are remarkably simple. They're bits of genetic material surrounded by a protective coating. And they're small, some just 20 nanometers wide. To put that in perspective, the head of a needle is about 1 million nanometers wide. The outbreak that began in China at the end of 2019 was a coronavirus so named because its spiky proteins resemble a corona, the Latin word for crown. These protein crowns allow the virus to stick to, and then invade, a host. Think of it as Velcro. Velcro sticks together because the two sides have a series of hooks and loops. A virus will Velcro itself onto a host cell and force it to manufacture new viruses. It happens quickly, 10,000 in a few hours, hundreds of millions of viruses in just a few days. <coughs> Ultimately, through coughing or sneezing, the virus will jump to a new host. 
Most viruses start with wild animals and then jump to humans, a process called zoonosis or spillover. And when wild animals and humans are in close contact, the odds of a spillover increase dramatically. These spillovers have happened for thousands of years. The HIV virus came from a chimpanzee. Ebola traveled from a fruit bat to a monkey, then on to a human. Influenza comes from birds and pigs. And in late 2019, a new virus would bring the world to its knees. But where did it come from? And how did it spill over? Greetings. I'm from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. My name is Shi Zheng Li. It is a great pleasure to speak to you and share the story of how we found the source of the SARS virus. During the 2003 SARS outbreak, Dr. Shi Zheng Li gained a reputation as one of China's top virus hunters. And since then, she has been tracking other viruses to their source. A place known as the reservoir. In 2018, she recalled her hunt for the source of SARS at a Yixi Talk event, the Chinese version of a TED Talk. We ask ourselves, where did SARS come from? We have to answer their question to really control a future outbreak from the source. In the wild, there are animals that carry viruses for a long time but don't develop an infection. The host and the virus live in harmony. Scientists determined that the SARS virus had spilled over from wild civet cats, sold in China's wet markets. The markets were shut down, but just temporarily. Barely two months after SARS was over, the Chinese government quickly reopened the market. Since then, researchers around the world have warned that the wild animals in the wet markets were viral time bombs, a view echoed inside China as well. China's top medical scientist, uh, Professor Zhong, you know, warned the Chinese government, this market must be shut down. It's non-negotiable. He was saying that if we don't shut down these markets, we are heading for another pandemic. But while the civets carried the virus, they weren't the source of it. So Shi Zhen Li and a team of scientists went hunting for the reservoir. The prime suspect? China's bat population, which includes more than 100 species. Month after month, they explored caves in remote parts of China, trapping dozens of different bat species. And at last, they found what they were looking for. We detected a coronavirus. This coronavirus and the SARS virus are closely related. But she didn't just discover one coronavirus. She discovered hundreds of them. So her team kept narrowing their search. After more than a decade, they discovered that horseshoe bats in the Yunnan province carried a coronavirus strain that was 97% identical to the one in the civets that had started the SARS virus. How did the virus get there? Bats infected the civets at the farm. The farm civets were sold to a wildlife market in Guangdong, where it spread and mutated. Finally, SARS was able to infect a person and also spread through human-to-human -human transmission. If we hadn't abused the civets, this wouldn't have happened. SARS wouldn't have broken out. Xi's discovery was a breakthrough that earned her the nickname Batwoman. Now that scientists knew the source of so many coronaviruses, they could study them, and they hoped develop a broad-spectrum vaccine to stop them. But the research also came with a warning. If we do not become vigilant, Another outbreak is entirely possible. How many viruses can infect a human? The answer is kind of scary. During the height of the SARS outbreak, 
the Chinese government had announced plans to build laboratories that would study the world's most dangerous pathogens. These labs would have the highest levels of biosafety. Air, water, and waste were filtered. Researchers were required to shower and change clothes before and after using lab facilities. One lab was built to withstand a magnitude 7 earthquake. The plan was to build half a dozen of these labs by the year 2025. The first of these virology institutes was cleared to open in January 2018, complete with a grant to study bat coronaviruses, funded by U.S. taxpayers. And the deputy director was none other than China's bat woman, Xi Zhen Li. The location, the city of Wuhan. Wuhan, China, home to 11 million people. On December 10th, 2019, a local shrimp vendor starts to feel sick. 57-year-old Wei Gik Shun gets some antibiotics at a local clinic and goes back to her stall at the Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market. The market is like a giant mall, roughly the size of nine football fields. It's a huge marketplace. It has fresh vegetable, fruits, dried vegetable, nuts, and all kinds of, you know, food products. The wet market, one of hundreds in Wuhan, also offers exotic animals for sale. Everything from civets and crocodiles to peacocks and snakes. Some of the animals are listed as live, which means that they're slaughtered, skinned, and served right in front of you. That way, you know it's fresh. The conditions at the Huanan and other wet markets are notoriously unsanitary. Garbage piles up on damp floors. Ventilation is poor. Live animals, squirming, clawing, and quacking, are crammed into cages and stacked one on top of another. All sorts of fluids, pus, blood, and excrement trickle down on the animals trapped below. Add in throngs of people shopping in close quarters, and you have the perfect breeding ground for a virus. December 31st, 2019, New Year's Eve in Wuhan. Market vendor Wei Gik Shun is in a hospital quarantine. She's one of the first to be hit by the virus. Now she's one of dozens of patients. Dr. Li Wen Liang worries about the repercussions of his now viral post. The Chinese government notifies the Beijing office of the World Health Organization about an outbreak of a pneumonia with an unknown cause something China's own CDC has known for at least two days. The Wuhan Health Commission releases a statement saying there is no need to be alarmed. Xi Zhenli, China's Batwoman, can't sleep. She has a different set of fears, specifically that the contagion came from her lab. She searches frantically through the records to see if any experiments had been mishandled. Fortunately, the answer is no, but others aren't convinced. Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton is among the first to raise suspicions. These labs, in the middle of a huge metropolitan city, had bats present, they were researching coronaviruses, and we further know that China has a history of sloppy safety standards at these laboratories. The Washington Post reported that U.S. Embassy officials toured the Wuhan lab back in January 2018 and walked away with major concerns. According to a cable they sent back to Washington, the new lab has a serious shortage of appropriately trained technicians and investigators needed to safely operate. The Post also noted that Xi Zhenli herself 
had been criticized earlier for taking unnecessary risks in her research. Even if there are legitimate reasons to conduct this research, the Chinese Communist Party has shown itself incapable of doing so in a safe manner. An accidental release from a lab wouldn't be unprecedented. SARS viruses had escaped from a Beijing containment facility multiple times before. Xi Zhenli said she guaranteed with her life that the new coronavirus was unrelated to her lab. The bat woman would swear on her life that she's not responsible and these labs aren't responsible, otherwise the Chinese Communist Party might take her life. Then again, the bat woman didn't run the only lab in Wuhan. The Wuhan Center for Disease Control and Prevention is just miles away. And while Xi's lab operated at biosecurity level four, the Wuhan CDC was a less secure level two. Despite their lower security level, the Wuhan CDC also worked with the same species of bats studied by Xi Zhenli. And they too have been accused of not taking necessary precautions. Chinese media featured one scientist from the Wuhan CDC as he went searching through caves. According to reports in 2017 and 2019, he was once attacked by a bat, and he wasn't wearing adequate protection when another one urinated on his head. It just so happens that this particular lab is located in the same neighborhood as the Huanan Seafood Market, the supposed epicenter of the outbreak. There's not a shred of evidence to suggest that this virus came from those food markets. All of the evidence that we have today, even though it's circumstantial, points directly at one of those two laboratories in Wuhan. Senator Cotton isn't the only one saying this. A researcher with the South China University of Technology concluded that the killer coronavirus probably originated from a laboratory in Wuhan. Although the author behind this explosive allegation later walked it back, saying it was based on speculation and not firm evidence. U.S. intelligence agencies are still debating the origins of the new or novel coronavirus. They found no direct evidence linking the virus to one of the labs, but they still won't rule out an accidental release. Some scientists say the evidence favors a natural transmission of the virus. Dr. Robert Gary was part of an international team who researched the virus's origins. Was it an accident from a lab? Very, very unlikely compared to all the other natural exposures. Dr. Gary and other scientists say this time the carrier may not be the bat. He discovered that the novel virus has a 99% genetic link to viruses found in the pangolin, a delicacy sold in wet markets all over China, and one of the most illegally trafficked animals in the world. Scientists may never know the source of the virus or how it first spread in Wuhan. No matter how it happened, the Chinese government had a crisis on its hands, and they went to great lengths to cover it up. The word went up the chain of command fairly quickly and they began to take action. Xi Zhen Li and her team determined early on that the new virus was a SARS coronavirus. However, the director of her institution ordered the staff not to disclose that information. It would be nine days before Chinese authorities released Xi's findings to the public. Beijing has done its best to prevent the foreign community from actively studying this. The orders extended beyond Wuhan. A researcher in Shanghai had been studying the virus, and the Chinese government quickly moved to silence him as well. His lab was shut down, and he was ordered to destroy the samples. So, I mean, we have, we have pretty early evidence that, uh, of a cover-up in place. You're destroying the very information you need to help save human lives. On January 6th, the American CDC offered to send a team to China to help investigate the new disease. The response from the Chinese government? Silence. 
We are urging China. More cooperation and transparency are the most important steps you can take toward a more effective response. From January 5th through the 17th, local officials stopped reporting new cases to the Chinese CDC. And yet during that time, hospitals in Wuhan were steadily filling with new patients. The numbers that come out of China are laughable. The Chinese Communist Party lie and they cover up and they spread propaganda and disinformation. On January 11th, Chinese state media reports the first death from the virus. Three days later, the World Health Organization uses Twitter to repeat a line straight from the Chinese authorities. They say that based on evidence from China, we don't believe that this is human to human transmissible, which is an indication that Beijing actually worked to convince the world of something it knew that it was not true. The now infamous tweet contradicts the findings of the WHO's own doctors. They knew the virus was already spreading through human to human transmission. Doctors in Wuhan had been saying it for weeks. To quote one of them, we knew then that the government was lying, but we don't know why they needed to lie. Maybe they thought it could be controlled, but it couldn't. The virus had already traveled beyond China's borders. On January 13, Thailand reports the first international case of the novel coronavirus. Three days later, the virus appears in Japan. Other Asian countries follow quickly. South Korea, Taiwan, then Hong Kong. On January 15th, a man from Washington state returns home from a trip to Wuhan. He doesn't know it at the time. He doesn't even feel sick. But in a few days, he would be the first confirmed case of coronavirus in the United States. Just before he tests positive, the U.S. announces that passengers from Wuhan would be screened at airports in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York. But it's too little, too late. In the months since the virus was first identified, 430,000 people have arrived in the United States on direct flights from China. They were allowing the virus to go around the world. On the same day that the coronavirus arrives in the U.S., scientists from the American CDC announced that while the threat is remote, they are developing tests to detect it. Three weeks later, those tests mistakenly contaminated with the disease fail. One lab official observes that, quote, we're screwed from a testing standpoint if this virus takes off in the U.S. It will be another three weeks before the FDA allows clinical labs to develop their own tests. Halfway around the world on January 18th, Wuhan officials prepare for the city's Chinese New Year banquet. 40,000 families fill a residential neighborhood to share home-cooked food and take group photos. That neighborhood later sees its own viral outbreak. On January 23rd, more than a month after the virus first surfaced, Wuhan is finally placed on lockdown. But before the deadline, crowds of people overwhelm the airports and train stations. Somewhere between five and seven million of them leave Wuhan without being tested for the virus. And even after the lockdown begins, only domestic travel is banned. The Chinese government still allows international flights to leave Wuhan. Thousands of travelers head to the United States, Europe, and Australia. After having seen the coronavirus cripple his country, if he wanted to get even by leveling the playing field by spreading coronavirus around the world, he would have done exactly what in fact he did. And they decided if they were going to go into recession or depression that they were going to take the rest of the world with it. 
And for those decisions, China needs to pay severe consequences. On January 30th, the World Health Organization finally declares a global health emergency. The novel coronavirus outbreak is a public health emergency of international concern. And less than two weeks later, the WHO gives the virus a new name, COVID-19. As the virus spread around the world, many countries faced shortages of much needed medical equipment. It wasn't just because of an increased demand. While Beijing downplayed the severity of the outbreak in public, the Chinese government stepped up its import of medical supplies and built a secret stockpile. When China did send out masks and testing equipment, the nations who received them quickly learned that they were defective. As of May 2020, the Huanan Seafood Wholesale Market in Wuhan remains closed. But in a mind-boggling decision, the Chinese government has allowed other wet markets to reopen. They've temporarily banned the trade and consumption of exotic animals. And some organizations have urged the Chinese to make the ban permanent. But so far, no luck. Shutting down wildlife wet markets should not only happen in China, around the world. It should all be shut down. In the meantime, the world remains at risk. Wherever people are closing in on nature, there is the chance for a virus to escape its reservoir. The chance for the next outbreak. Therefore, if we want to prevent new diseases at their source, the answer is quite simple. Just stay away from it. Put an end to white animal consumption. Reduce wildlife exposure. Reduce the chance of pathogens of spreading from wild animals to humans. My report is closed. Thank you, everyone. Xi Zhen Li, the Batwoman, has been trying to find a solution to the pandemic while also dodging accusations that it's partly her fault. Joining her are scientists searching for viral reservoirs around the globe. So far, they've found hundreds, and yet they say that's only the tip of the iceberg. There are thousands of viruses just waiting to be discovered. And in the words of Xi Zhen Li, we must find them before they find us.